Welcome to the Energize, Explore, Enjoy podcast, where we bring you inspiring conversations about food, fitness, and adventure, fueled by the power of the energy pods. Let's do this. Welcome back to the Energize, Explore, Enjoy podcast. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of food additives. These are substances added to food to preserve flavor or enhance taste and appearance. They've been used for centuries, and today we're going to explore their history, the science behind them, how they're added to our food, and more. We'll also bust some myths and give you some tips on how to navigate the realm of food additives. Hey there, listeners. This episode is sponsored by the ever-amazing KG Food Company's Energy Pods. Are you ready for a flavor adventure? Get ready to taste white chocolate strawberry, breakfast mocha noir, and the fan favorite chocolate nova. These pods are not only delicious, but also are packed with protein, healthy fats, and minimal sugar to keep you going all day. Plus, they come with a built-in spoon for your on-the-go snacking needs. So, don't wait another minute. Head over to KG Food foodco.com kgfoodco.com and order some energy pods to fuel your life hello my name is fahad and i'm the founder of kg food company and the manufacturers of the infamous energy pods today is all about those additives the history of food additives is as old as civilization itself from the ancient egyptians salting fish to preserve it to medieval Europeans using brine solutions to keep their meats fresh, to the Greeks and Romans using sulfur to prevent spoilage, food additives have played a crucial role in our survival and progress. One of the most common additives we use is found on everyone's table, salt. So let's talk about salt. Let us go back in time. Ancient Egypt was a civilization flourishing on the banks of the mighty Nile River. Amidst the pyramids and pharaohs, a culinary revolution was taking place. The Egyptians, in their wisdom, discovered a technique that would change the course of food preservation forever. Salting. In a land where the sun blazed relentlessly, they began to coat their catch of fish with a generous layer of salt. The fish were then left hung dry. Under the scorching sun, the salt drawing out all the moisture and creating an inhospitable environment for bacteria. This ingenious method allowed them to store vast quantities of fish, providing a reliable source of sustenance during lean times and enabling trade over long distance. Some believe that the traditional Egyptian dish of fisik, I hope I got the pronunciation right, a fermented fish delicacy has its roots in this ancient preservation method. Fast forward a few centuries to medieval Europe. The technique of salting had traveled across continents and was now a common practice for preserving meats like beef, pork, and fish. Large quantities of salt were mixed with water to create something called a brine solution, a salty bath in which the food was soaked or submerged for a short period or long period of time. This method effectively removed moisture and inhibited bacterial growth, ensuring that even the largest armies had a steady supply of preserved food. As the 15th and 16th centuries dawned, the world was on the move. Trade routes were expanding and explorers were venturing into uncharted territories. The use of salt for food preservation became even more critical. Sailors and explorers relied heavily on salted foods during their long voyages. The salt-preserved food provided a reliable source of sustenance that could withstand the rigor of extended sea journeys without spoiling. In other words, we wouldn't have the exploration of the world without salt. Thus, from the banks of Nile to the ships of the explorers, the humble salt has played a pivotal role in our culinary and food history. It's a testament to human ingenuity and the quest for survival, a story that continues to season our food and lives to this day. Let us journey back in time once more, this time to a different part of the world, over 2,500 years ago to ancient China. Amidst the rise of dynasties and creation of the Great Wall, a culinary masterpiece was taking shape, the birth of soy sauce. In a land abundant with soybeans, the Chinese were on a quest to unlock the potential of this versatile legume. 
They discovered a process that would not only preserve the beans, but also transform them into a flavorful umami-rich elixir. This process was fermentation and the result of the first soy sauce. The creation of soy sauce was a labor of love. It began with a mixture of crushed soybeans, wheat, salt, and water. This mixture was shaped into cakes and left to ferment under the sun. Over time, the cakes would develop a rich, moldy crust, a sign that the magic of fermentation was at work. These cakes were then transferred to a large earthenware pot filled with brine. The pots were covered and left to ferment for months, sometimes even years. The result was a dark, aromatic liquid that was strained and bottled, the world's first soy sauce. This innovative preservation method not only extended the shelf life of soybeans, but unlocked a depth of flavor that was unparalleled. The sauce was rich, salty, and packed with umami, the elusive fifth taste that makes our taste buds sing. As centuries passed, the art of making soy sauce spread across Asia, each region adding its unique twist. From the sweet, thick, Kikap manis, hopefully I got the pronunciation right, in Indonesia to tamari in Japan, soy sauce has evolved into a symphony of flavors that continue to define Asian cuisine. So, the next time you reach out for that bottle of soy sauce, just remember it's rich history. Each drop carries with it a story of ancient China, a tale of fermentation, and a tradition that has stood the test of time. Now let's talk about a food that everybody likes, pickles. However, not a lot of people know that it has ancient roots as well. In fact, our journey begins in the ancient civilization of Mesopotamia, around 2400 BC, where cucumbers from India were pickled in the Tigris Valley. The art of pickling then arrived to Egypt. Later, legend has it that Cleopatra, the renowned queen of ancient Egypt, attributed her good health and remarkable beauty to her hearty diet of pickles. One could argue that she was the first queen of wellness. The Egyptians were known to pickle not just cucumbers, but also melons, onions, and even fish. Fast forward to ancient Greece, where pickles were held in high esteem. Aristotle, the great philosopher, praised the healing effects of pickled cucumbers. Even Julius Caesar, the mighty Roman general, believed that pickles lent physical and spiritual strength and fed them to his soldiers. As we move into the Middle Ages, pickling continued to spread across the cultures. It became a practical necessity for sailors on long voyages, including the explorers who discovered the brave new world. The vitamin C in pickled vegetables prevented scurvy, a common affliction for sailors at that time. In the 16th century, cucumbers made their way to the Americas, where pickling became a popular food preservation method. Fast forward to the 19th and earlier 20th centuries, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe popularized the classic New York style dill pickles that we know and love today. In Asia, pickling has a rich history too. In ancient India, pickling was used as a common method of preserving fruits and vegetables. In Korea, the tradition of making kimchi, a type of pickled cabbage, dates back thousands of years. Today, Pickling is a global culinary phenomena with countless regional variations and techniques. Whether it's the dill pickles of America to the kimchi of Korea, the gherkins of Europe to the achar of India, pickling continues to be the beloved method of food preservation and flavor enhancement. For our next additive, let us talk about something that is extremely close to us here in Napa Valley, where our company is based. We're talking about wine. And wine has a rich history when it comes to preservation. So let us take a step back in time once more to the cradle of Western civilization, ancient Greece. Here amidst the grandeur of the Parthenon and the wisdom of the philosophers, a culinary innovation was also taking place. The use of sulfur as a fumigant to preserve fruits and vegetables. The Greeks, known for their advancements in various fields, discovered that burning sulfur and exposing food to its fumes acted as a natural antimicrobial agent. This inhibited the growth of bacteria and fungi, Fungi? Fungi? <laughs> the primary culprits behind food spoilage, thereby preserving the quality and freshness of the food. 
The baton of sulfur preservation was then passed to the Romans, who, with their love for wine, recognized the benefits of sulfur in preserving this cherished beverage. They used sulfur candles or sulfur-rich minerals, such as sulfur dioxide releasing rocks, to treat wine barrels. This innovative technique prevented spoilage and ensured that the Romans could enjoy their wine at the finest. As the Roman Empire fell and the Middle Ages dawned, the knowledge of using sulfur compounds for food preservation were kept alive by monastic orders in Europe. These monks in their secluded monasteries continued the tradition of using sulfur compounds in winemaking and food preservation, a testament to the enduring legacy of this preserving technique. The Renaissance was a period of renewed scientific inquiry and discovery, brought a greater focus on understanding the nature of substances. This era saw advancements in chemistry and a more systematic approach to winemaking. Winemakers and scholars began to recognize the specific role of sulfur dioxide in wine preservation, marking a significant milestone in the history of food preservation. In the 16th century, Italian physician and naturalist Andrea Bacci published a treatise on winemaking titled De Naturale Venorum Historia. Hopefully, I got it right. In this seminal work, Bacci highlighted the importance of sulfur dioxide in winemaking. He detailed its ability to prevent spoilage and preserve wine quality, recommending the addition of sulfur compounds to wine barrels to protect against microbial contamination and oxidation. Fast forward to the 19th century, the use of sulfur dioxide expanded beyond winemaking. It was recognized as an effective preservative for a wide range of food products. Sulfur dioxide prevented discoloration and bacterial growth in dried fruits such as apricots, raisins, and prunes, ensuring these fruits could be enjoyed long after their harvest. Sulfur dioxide was used in various forms, such as sulfur dioxide gas, sulfuric acid, and sulfides. It was employed in food processing and storage to prevent spoilage, control enzymatic browning, and extend the shelf life of perishable goods. Today, the legacy of sulfur dioxide continues. It remains a vital tool in food preservation, a testament to our history, our ancestors, and our quest to preserving the bounties of nature. Now for the next evolution in food preservation. It's not really per se an additive, but I think that it combines a lot of additives together and you'll find out in just a moment what I'm talking about. But before I reveal it, let's, let's set the stage. Imagine the world in the 18th century, a time of exploration and scientific discovery after all. We just came out of the Renaissance. Amidst this backdrop of changes and progress, a great culinary revolution was brewing in the heart of France. The protagonist of our story is Nicolas Appert, a French confectioner and chef who was about to make a groundbreaking observation that would forever change the way we preserve food. Appert noticed that food stored in sealed glass bottles when subjected to heat would remain preserved for extended periods of time. This was a revelation, a spark that ignited a passion within him to solve the age-old problem of food spoilage. Now you also have to realize in the background a lot of things were happening the world was getting closer we were discovering and there was warfare going on at the same time so the need was really dire the french army needed long-lasting provisions for their campaigns and appert discovery was just promising solution driven by his desire to serve his country and his relentless curiosity he dedicated himself to experimenting with preservation techniques his kitchen became a laboratory like all kitchens can, a place of relentless trial and error, and he sought to perfect this method. After years of painstaking research, in 1809, Appert presented his innovative method to the French government. This technique known as appertization or appertizing was a game changer, though it does not really have any connection with, you know, appetizers. Appert's method was simple yet ingenious. He sealed food in glass jars with cork stoppers, which were then immersed in boiling water. This process heated and sterilized the contents, killing any spoilage causing bacteria and molds. The jars were then tightly sealed with wax or resin to create an airtight environment, effectively preserving the food inside. News of Appert's discovery spread like wildfire, sparking a revolution in food preservation. 
His technique, combined with existing methods such as using sulfur and salting, was a beacon of progress in the world where food spoilage was a constant challenge. But the story doesn't end there. Abbott's technique was later refined and adapted by others, included Peter Durand, an English merchant, and Durand basically replaced Abbott's glass jar with tin-plated iron cans, a modification that was more durable and easier to transport. This innovation led to the birth of what we call canning today. So the next time you go to a grocery store and look at a can of food, just remember the fascinating journey of canning from a humble kitchen in France to your pantry today. Quite a bit of a legacy there, isn't it? Now that we've put a can on that topic, let's talk about something that is basically in every household. It's right next to salt, basically, when it comes to preservation and has played a huge role in our entire human history. But just as with our previous methods of preservation, let's go back in time once more to a time when ancient civilizations like the Egyptians and Persians were laying the foundations of society as we know it. Amidst their many contributions to human progress, one discovery really stood out the preservative properties of sugar. These civilizations were among the first to harness the power of sugar, using it to preserve fruits by drying them in the sun and then coating them with a thick layer of honey or molasses. These natural sweeteners acted as preservatives, creating an environment that inhibited the growth of bacteria and moles. Fast forward to the medieval Europe, where sugar was a precious and sought after commodity. Crusaders returning from the Middle East brought back these sweet treasure called sugar canes. This led to the establishment of sugar plantations in regions like Sicily and Spain. However, sugar was not just a sweet treat. It was valued for its medicinal properties and was considered a luxury item. As the production of sugar expanded, so did its role in food preservation. Sugar was employed in various preservation techniques, such as making jams, jellies, and marmalades. The high sugar content created an inhospitable environment for bacteria, preventing spoilage and extending the shelf life of fruits and other ingredients. The 18th and 19th centuries marked a significant development in the history of sugar. Large-scale sugar plantations sprouted in the Caribbean and in the Americas, leading to an increased accessibility and affordability of sugar. This sweet commodity was no longer a luxury item, but a staple in households, playing a crucial role in food preservation. The historical significance of sugar in food preservation is a tale, once again, of ingenuity and adaptation, learning from the past and applying it and evolving it. That's been the story for science and a lot of the things that we have today as well. Everything is a step-by-step -step journey moving forwards. As we moved forward into the 19th century, things became a lot crazier. There was a surge of scientific exploration that led to the discovery of several food additives that would revolutionize the preservation of foods. This basically ushered in the modern era of food additives. They still, however, had a root in ancient history. The journey of our next additive began in the heart of London in the mid-19th century, where a German chemist named Justus von Liebig was fervently exploring the world of chemical reactions. Amidst the clinking of glassware and hum of his bustling laboratory, Liebig made a discovery that would leave a significant mark on the world of food preservation. In 1834, he found that formaldehyde, a pungent gas, had a potent ability to prevent spoilage of organic matter. This discovery would set the stage for a new chapter in the history of food preservation. As the 19th century gave way to the 20th, formaldehyde began to be used as a food preservative thanks to antimicrobial properties. It was believed that adding formaldehyde to food products could inhibit bacterial growth and extend their shelf life. From milk to meat to fish, formaldehyde found its way into a variety of food products. However, the use of formaldehyde in food preservation grew so did the concerns about its safety. Studies and investigations began to reveal that formaldehyde could pose as a significant health risk. Known to be a carcinogen, prolonged exposure to high levels of formaldehyde was linked to respiratory issues, digestive problems, and other adverse health effects. 
In response to these concerns, regulatory bodies in the United States i.e. the Food and Drug Administration FDA stepped in. They prohibited the use of formaldehyde as a food additive, prioritizing the safety and health of consumers. This decision marked a turning point in the story of formaldehyde serving as a stark reminder of importance of rigorous safety regulations and ongoing research in the world of food preservation. This is a cautionary tale reminding us of the delicate balance between innovation and safety. It really does underscore the importance of continuous research and stringent regulations in ensuring the provision of safe and healthy food products. As we venture into more modern food preservatives and additives, here's another story that doesn't get as much limelight but is a very important additive. In the annals of food preservation, the tale of benzoic acid and sodium benzoate holds a special place. This story begins centuries ago, with benzoic acid a compound naturally found in various fruits and plants, such as berries and cinnamon. Ancient civilizations recognized its preservative properties and harnessed them in ways that would echo down the ages. In the arid sands of ancient Egypt, benzoic acid was part of the embalming concoction was used in the preservation of mummies. The Egyptians discovered that this compound could inhibit the growth of bacteria and fungi, thereby preventing the decomposition of organic matter. This realization sparked an interest in benzoic acid that would eventually extend to food preservation. Fast forward to the 19th century, an era of rapid advancement in food preservation and chemistry. German chemist Friedrich Ferdinand and Justice von Liebig, we talked about him earlier, isolated benzoic acid from benzoin resin. They identified its potential as a food preservative, noting its effectiveness in inhibiting the growth of microorganisms, thereby preventing spoilage. In 1875, the use of benzoic acid as a food preservative took a significant leap forward. British physician and chemist Sir James Crichton Brown patented a method to combine benzoic acid with other substances, creating a stable and effective preservative. This revolutionized food preservation, paving the way for commercial products and widespread use of benzoic acid as an additive in food and beverages. Today, benzoic acid and its sodium salt, sodium benzoate, are commonly used preservatives in a wide range of food and beverage products. From soft drinks to jams to sauces to pickles, these compounds help prevent microbial growth, extend shelf life, and maintain the quality and freshness of various food items. This fascinating journey from ancient use in mummification to its modern role in food preservation is a clear testament to how ancient wisdom does merge really well with scientific discovery and innovation. Though the 19th century was quite a bit of a scientific renaissance, the 20th century marked a significant turning point in the world of food preservation as well, with the advent of synthetic additives. One of the most notable breakthroughs was the discovery of nitrites and nitrates, which revolutionized the preservation of meat products. Derived from sodium or potassium salts, these compounds effectively inhibited bacterial growth and prevented spoilage, ensuring longer shelf life and safer consumption. As the century progressed, the food industry saw the introduction of artificial sweeteners such as saccharin and aspartame. These innovative additives provided the sweet taste that consumers craved without the calories, offering a new option for individuals seeking to manage their sugar intake. But the advancements didn't stop at preservation and sweetness. The 20th century also witnessed the rise of emulsifiers, stabilizers, and thickeners. Additives such as lecithins and xanthan gum found their way into a wide variety of processed foods, enhancing texture, improving consistency, and ensuring a desired mouthfeel. You know what they say, the customer's always right. As we transitioned into the 21st century, food science continued to push the boundaries. Natural antioxidants such as vitamin E and rosemary extract gained popularity. Their ability to prevent oxidation and extend shelf life of the product without compromising flavor or quality made them highly sought after by the food manufacturers. Simultaneously, a shift in the consumers also took place. People became more aware of the ingredients in their food, leading to a demand for 
clean label alternatives. This shift encouraged the development of natural preservatives like acetic acid, citric acid, and various plant extracts. Derived from natural sources, these substances offered a viable solution for those seeking additives with a shorter and more recognizable ingredient list. We are really at the starting point, and there is a huge rise in exploration and innovation with additives such as encapsulated flavors, modified starches, and even edible films. These cutting-edge additives opened up a frontier of culinary creativity enabling chefs and food scientists to create mind-boggling taste experiences and visually stunning presentations. So the journey is continuing and additives and preservatives have been part of our history since we can remember it. Hey listeners, before we jump back into our fascinating conversation, let's take a moment to appreciate the delicious goodness of KG Food Company's Energy Pods. These delightful pods come in a variety of amazing flavors, like white chocolate strawberry, breakfast mocha noir, and the ever-popular chocolate nova. And they're not just tasty, they're also packed with protein, healthy fats, and minimal sugar to keep you fueled throughout the day. Perfect for when you're on the go, these energy pods even come with a built-in spoon for your convenience. So, go ahead and treat yourself to these mouth-watering pods that'll make your taste buds dance. Visit kgfoodco.com, kgfoodco.com to grab your favorite flavors. And now, let's get back to our inspiring guest. Now that we have ventured into the history of food additives, we can move on and talk about the different types of additives you will find on a food product. These can be categorized into several different types with its their unique origins, their different methods of extraction, and even their potential nutritive value. Let's start with preservatives. These are used to prevent food spoilage from bacteria, molds, fungi, and yeast. For instance, ascorbic acid, also known as vitamin C, naturally found in fruits and vegetables like oranges and bell peppers. It is extracted through a fermentation process and besides its preserving properties, it is a well-known antioxidant. Citric acid is also another preservative and is derived from citrus fruits like lemons and limes and it's obtained through fermentation process using the mold Aspergillus niger. Hopefully I got that right. Sodium nitrate, often used in cured meats, is found naturally in leafy green vegetables, but the version used in food preservation is typically synthesized in a lab. Next, we have sweeteners, which add sweetness to foods. They can be divided into nutritive and non-nutritive sweeteners. Nutritive sweeteners such as sucrose or our regular table sugar or corn syrup provide the body with calories and are derived from sugar cane or sugar beets, which are tubers, through a process of extraction and crystallization. Non-nutritive sweeteners like stevia are very low in calories or contain no calories at all. Stevia, for example, is extracted from the leaves of the stevia plant native to South America. Next up, we have color additives that are used to enhance the color that is lost due to exposure to air. After all, people do like things to be colorful and pretty. This loss of color can happen due to various different factors such as temperature extremes, moisture, storage condition. So they also correct natural variations in colors too. Examples include beta carotene, which is found in carrots and pumpkins, and annatto extract derived from the seeds of the acciote tree, or acciote tree. I don't know how to pronounce it. Let's go roll with it. Beta carotene is also known for its antioxidant properties and its role in vitamin A production. So notice over here very interestingly that a lot of these additives can function as not only coloring or texturizing or tasting agents, but they also can be nutritive components of food as well. There's also the flavor enhancers which enhance, you know, the flavors already present in foods without having a much of taste of their own. An example is monosodium glutamate or MSG, which is derived from the fermentation of starch, sugar beets, sugar cane or molasses. Despite its bad rap, MSG is naturally found in foods like tomatoes and cheese. Lastly, we have texturizing agents which are used for gelling, thickening, emulsifying, etc. They help in improving the texture and consistency of foods. For example, agar-agar is a gelling agent and is derived from red algae 
and pectin, which is used for thickening, is extracted from citrus peels and apple pomace. Both of these texturizers are very high in fiber. Once again, notice that a lot of these additives and ingredients are simply foods that are either taken from a different part of a plant or food product that we're already eating, and they also can have a nutritive or non-nutritive component that is part of our diet already. One of the concerns that people have with food additives is the safety. And a lot of people don't know how an additive is added into our food system, which is a very important question here. So let's delve into that now. Food additives, both natural and synthetic, are not inherently bad. They undergo rigorous testing by food safety authorities worldwide. In the United States, for example, the Food and Drug Administration FDA, oversees the use of food additives. The FDA classifies food additives as generally recognized as safe or GRAS, G -R -A -S, based on a long history of common use in food or on the results of extensive research. However, it's very important to note that some individuals may have some intolerances or, or allergies to certain food additives. For instance, sulfites can trigger an allergic reaction in some people. However, it's also very important to note that these may be either an exception to the rule or they may be just associative when it comes to the science behind them. Now, let's dive into the journey of how food additives make their way into our food system. Before a new food additive can grace our supermarket shelves, it embarks on a rigorous scientific expedition. First, researchers conduct extensive laboratory studies to examine the additive's chemical composition, potential toxicity, and effects on the body. They scrutinize it from every angle, looking for any red flags or hidden dangers. The adventure continues with animal studies. Scientists expose our furry friends to different doses of additives, closely observing their reactions and monitoring for any adverse effects. These tests provide crucial insights into how the additives might affect living organisms and help determine safe dosage levels. The journey, however, doesn't stop there. It's time for human studies. Brave volunteers participate in carefully controlled studies. Researchers administer varying amounts of additives to measure its impact on human health. They track everything from digestion to metabolism, ensuring that no stone is left unturned in their quest for safety. But the journey doesn't even end there. Regulatory authorities such as the FDA or ESFA, which is the European Food Safety Authority, act as gatekeepers, reviewing all scientific evidence with meticulous precision. These expert panels assess data weighing the potential risk and benefits to make an informed decision about the additive's safety. Only after successfully passing this rigorous scientific expedition and receiving the seal of approval from regulatory authorities can an additive finally join the food system. So, the next time you encounter an additive in your favorite snack or meals, just remember that the journey it took to reach your plate was extensive. It's a tale of scientific scrutiny, animal adventurers, daring human trials, and meticulous evaluations. This is very important because there might be many products in the food system that may not undergo any sort of testing, but may be used as marketing fodder, and you might be sold onto something that is potentially not good for you. Now, food additives have a bit of a reputation around them in many of the nutrition circles. So let's talk about some of the fun facts and myths about these food additives. First off, let's kick off with a fun fact that might surprise you. Did you know that the most widely used additives are sugar, salt, and corn syrup? Yup. These common household items are used in a plethora of processed foods. For instance, corn syrup is often found in sodas, candies, and even bread. So in other words, a lot of the stuff that is being added exists in our homes already. Second, here's a myth buster for you. The term natural doesn't always equate to safe. There's a common misconception about natural foods additives that are assumed safer than the synthetic ones. However, remember that many substances that naturally occur may be toxic or can cause allergies. For example, 
A certain types of mushrooms are natural but can be deadly if consumed. Now let's talk about MSG and the infamous Chinese restaurant syndrome. This term was coined in the 1960s and has since been associated with symptoms like headaches and dizziness. However, numerous studies have found no conclusive evidence linking MSG to these reported symptoms. The perception of MSG sensitivity may be influenced by other factors, such as, you know, placebo effect. MSG is often used in savory dishes like soups and processed meats to enhance their flavor. Next, have you ever wondered what those mysterious E numbers on food labels are? Well, E numbers are simply codes assigned to food additives by the European Union. They indicate that the additive has been approved for use in food and has undergone safety assessments. For example, E300 is a number or an E number for ascorbic acid or simply vitamin C which is found in fruits and vegetables. Here's a colorful fact for you. Some natural food colorings might really surprise you. For example, the vibrant red color of some candies or beverages may come from crushed insects called cochineal beetles which produce a red pigment called carmine. It's a testament to the variety of sources that can be used for natural coloring. Let's talk about the uncured myth. Nitrites are commonly used in cured meats like bacon and hot dogs to prevent bacterial growth and add flavor. Some products labeled as uncured or no nitrites added still contain natural sources of nitrites such as celery juice, which naturally contains nitrates that convert to nitrites during processing. Next up, lastly, many Natural substances such as those derived from fruits, vegetables, and dairy products can also serve as food additives. For instance, lycopene from tomato byproducts and carotenoids from rice bran can be used as natural colorants. Similarly, byproducts from olives, passion fruit peels, and citrus peels can be used as texturizing agents. This highlights the potential for sustainable and healthful innovations for the food industry. Another example is pectin, which is derived from citrus peels and is used as a gelling agent in jams and jellies. Navigating this plethora of chemistry can be really daunting. However, we can give you some practical tips for navigating these waters. So let's dive into some practical tips. Remember, knowledge is power and understanding what these additives are and why they're used can help you make very informed choices. So here's some handy tips that will guide you on your food journey. First and foremost, become a label detective. Reading food labels is a crucial step in understanding what's in your food. Look for additives in the ingredient list. If you stumble upon an additive that sounds like it's straight out of a chemistry textbook, don't panic. Take a moment to research it and understand its purpose. You could even go to the FDA's website and you can find a plethora of science that will back up or show what kind of studies have been done on it. Extensive studies have been done on it. For example, if you see ascorbic acid on a label, a quick search will reveal that it's just another name for vitamin C, once again found in fruits and vegetables, and can prevent scurvy. Next, let's debunk the natural is always better myth. As we discussed earlier, the safety of an additive is determined by its conditions of use, not by whether it is natural or artificial. For instance, botulinum toxin is a naturally occurring substance, but it's also one of the most poisonous substances known to man. Third, be aware of your body and its sensitivities. Some people may have some intolerances or allergies to certain food additives. If you notice a pattern of symptoms after eating certain foods, it might be worth talking to a healthcare provider or dietitian. For example, some people may experience headaches or stomach discomfort after consuming foods with MSG. Lastly, stay informed and curious. Food science is a rapidly evolving field, new research is always emerging, and regulations can change. Stay informed about the latest findings to make the best decision for your health. Subscribe to a reputable health and nutrition newsletter. Follow trusted sources on social media or listen to podcasts like this one to keep up with the latest in the food science. And there you have it. In conclusion, food additives are a diverse group of substances with a range of functions, from preserving food to enhancing its taste and appearance. 
there are some newer applications of additives when it comes to the nutrition and health world. For example, as we were talking about encapsulation and various different types of interesting technologies that can really help modulate how nutrients are digested or released in our body is an avenue of exploration that is just begun. As always, it's very important to make informed decisions and choices while consulting with your healthcare provider if you have any concerns about your diet. And that's all for today's episode. Knowledge is power and understanding what's in our food can help us make better decisions. Thank you for being on this podcast with me. Now that the episode is over, join us next week where we talk to Kevin. He's one of our vendors for Energy Pods, actually our first ever vendor, and he has some amazing stories to share with us. Kevin runs a board shop here in Napa Valley, and we are really excited to have him on. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate, review, and subscribe to our Energize, Explore, Enjoy podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. See you next week.